And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nicole so she can introduce one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. I'm always liking his tweets every single day. Follow him at R. Christopher Whalen. Nicole, take it away. We introduce our last speaker just sending us off. And thank you so much, Chris, for being on. I, yeah, so I'm very excited to introduce Chris. This is a different perspective than one that we've been given from our previous five speakers. He has more of a financial markets perspective. In fact, when I talked to Chris, it was really interesting. His clients aren't you and me. They're not the people, they're corporations. So his perspective is going to be extremely interesting. It's going to be higher level. We're, when he was talking to me, uh, he gave me insight on the GSE's administration, the regulatory issues the economy outlook for the industry as a whole. I'm really excited about what he's gonna share. In the meantime, while I was waiting for him to come on board, I also noticed he's a huge tweeter. So if uh, you are engaged with what Chris is talking about today, I was jumping through his tweets, absolutely spot on with what's going on in the housing market. Chris, I'm really looking forward to having you share with us today. And I know that there'll be questions afterwards. Oh, great, Nicole. Thank you so much. It's always, uh, it's always good to, uh, you know, spend time with people in the industry. And you're right, there is stuff happening uh, in Washington late yesterday. The FHFA, which uh, regulates Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, came out with a new rule on liquidity that will put a lot of companies in this industry out of business if we don't do something about it. So go look at your email when you're done with this great event. And uh, if you have any questions, call me because, you know, myself, Dave, others are very engaged on this stuff right now. But it's just another curve that we didn't need right before Christmas. So um, let's roll with the slides, Ray. And then, uh, you know, if you guys have quiz, uh, questions, you know, we'll get into it. I'm not going to need the full time because I'm going to blast through some of this stuff. Um, the biggest risk that a lot of people in the industry don't think about because our industry is so operationally focused so focused on the consumer is uh, the Fed. Uh, in April, after the COVID thing broke and it was very clear that the economy and the markets were gonna take a big hit as a result of COVID, uh, the Fed went what they call big and they came in and dumped a lot of liquidity in the market and they almost tipped over a number of uh, independent mortgage banks and also some of the hybrid REITs, which are highly leveraged. And when you move the treasury bond market a point or two points in a couple of days, uh, the impact of that on margin calls for TBA trading and other things like warehouse lines that were subject to margin calls uh, really was quite horrific. Uh, we've recovered, volumes are great and we're rocking along, but remember that what the Fed is doing and the relationship between the Fed and the treasury, which I'm gonna talk about at the end, are very important. It's stuff that your capital markets people will mostly be focused on, but it really impacts our whole industry because you know mortgage banks are very nimble, very flexible, but we can't deal with tidal waves. Nobody can deal with tidal waves, right? Uh, and I think that that's really the biggest threat we face today is that the government thinks that they can do things to the market and use the market, for example, to help the economy, which is what the Fed is up to. Uh, but they gotta remember that they make you know, kill some people inadvertently in the process. When I worked at the Fed in New York back in the 80s, I remember that Jerry Corrigan would come into the trading room at seven in the morning after having breakfast with the uh, bank examiners across the street at uh, one of the pubs. And I'm, I'm very serious about that. And the first thing he would ask us was, had we run over any of the smaller dealers in our open market operations? Had we killed anybody, especially in Canadian dollars? So regulators always have to be aware of the, the downside impact of their actions. And I'll just leave it at, th at that. You heard from Mike already, lower for longer. Rates are going to be you know, low for a while. I disagree with Mike somewhat because he is so cautious and such a good analyst and such a great economist that he always thinks about both sides of the trade. And he always thinks about maybe interest rates going up. Now, the Fed is going to keep their foot on the short end of the yield curve. And as we're going to discuss a little later, the interchange between the Fed on the one hand and what's going on at the Treasury right now uh, could actually force short-term rates negative in the new year. Um, we may see anything up to one two-year Treasury uh, paper trade negative. And I know a lot of people don't think that's possible, but yes, it is. And I'll tell you why at the end. Go ahead and roll that slide, Ray. 
Um, this is the basic chart, obviously benchmark on the uh, on the uh, bottom there, and the you know the mortgage rate on the top. The one thing I would point out to you is that the mortgage rate doesn't necessarily follow the benchmark. A lot of our colleagues are still delivering in the you know two and a halfs and even threes. So you know we still set pricing for now. That may change in the future depending on what Washington decides. But I think the, it's not always the case that the spreads are stable. Now, I will say that even though volumes are probably going to be up next year, the spreads are falling, obviously. They're falling quite rapidly. In fact, we gave up 20 basis points plus in the last 30 days. So, yes, we'll have good volume. Spreads will still be okay, but they won't be record spreads like we saw in June and July. Uh, go ahead and roll that next slide. Now, this is kind of a bit of a hint of what I was talking about before with the Fed and the Treasury. This is the amount of cash that the Treasury has accumulated, which they deposited the Fed. They were anticipating a big stimulus bill. So the Treasury raised cash for the last quarter, almost uh, $2 trillion at the moment. Now, Steve Mnuchin, the current Secretary Tre uh, of the Treasury for the next 30 days, is now letting this balance run off. What does that mean? Well. He's letting that cash go back into the system. And the system is already up to its earlobes in cash, short-term cash uh, that banks hold. And so what may happen is as the Treasury is releasing cash, in other words, they're going to stop issuing as many T-bills, that collateral could get very scarce. It may be hard to get your hands on T-bills in the first quarter of this uh, year. And so you could see the demand for dollars, the demand for risk-free collateral, which is what a T-bill is, push rates down rather dramatically in the near term. So that's just something I would flag for you when you're working on interest rate risk and other issues on the capital market side of your business. Keep this in mind. I don't think it's going to affect mortgage rates very much, but it could throw the TBA market and the repo market where we do financing for Fairway and other companies into considerable disarray. There's a blog post on my, on my blog, the Institutional Risk Analyst, that goes into this at some length. So have a read on that and then call me if you have any questions. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Ray. Credit. All right. The beautiful thing about low interest rates is that the losses in the rare event that somebody actually defaults on a mortgage and the bank takes over the, the note or the non-bank company, uh, the, the loss rates are very low. Loss given default for bank paper right now is negative. That means that they can pay off the full amount of the note and make money if they actually go all the way through to default. Now, obviously, many loans that get into trouble are never going to actually go to foreclosure. We're going to fix them. We're going to short sale them, whatever we're doing, because the collateral value is so high and it's going up because of our friends at the Fed that it's almost hard to lose money on default. Um, this is a very strange situation. The average loss rate on one to four is owned by banks over the last 50 years is almost 70%. So when I tell you that they have a negative loss rate now and banks are actually making money on default, that is a red flag. That is not normal, but it shows you how extreme and how aggressive the Fed is being using interest rates and particularly using housing as a mechanism for providing stimulus to households. Uh, and the impact on asset prices is extraordinary. I just went to contract on a house, by the way, up in Westchester County. And why am I doing this? Because I got to get my wife and I out of New York City. Uh, commercial assets are in big trouble. Uh, the asset utilization rate in New York is probably 10% right now. So, you know, those assets are not worth what we thought they were. On the other hand, one to fours, residential housing, I think prices are going to keep going up for the next three to four years. So it's quite a, a disparity between the commercial side this time and the residential side. In 2008, residential was the problem. Not now. You know, people are wringing their hands about defaults and everything else. No, because as long as that note holder is protected by the fact that collateral prices are so high and likely to go higher, you know, it's a fairly easy situation to, to manage. COVID, the CARES Act, yes, we have problems there. But overall, I think the credit outlook for one to four is, is very strong and for multifamily as well, as long as they're not in big cities. Roll that next slide, Ray. Here we go, my favorite chart. 
Look at this chart, guys. Loss rates on bank owned one to fours have been negative for a couple of years. Again, this is not normal. The last time we saw this was when? 2004. That's when WAMU, Countrywide, several others were actually reporting negative charge offs on their one to fours because they were getting more money back than they were losing. That's not normal. Go to the next slide. Again, this is the other part of it is that if you look at one to four owned by banks right now, the delinquency rates are up, but the charge off rate is still zero. Okay, what is happening is that if those loans get to 90 days, somehow or another they get fixed, they don't roll off. And so, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that, yeah, we have delinquency. Michael was talking about that before that the FHA numbers are in double digits, high double digits in some cases, high teens in uh, New York, for example but the loss rates are very low. So until that changes, I don't think we have a credit problem. We have a consumer problem and we have to help these people obviously, but it's good for the markets because if you sell this collateral, it's, you know, it's gonna be okay. Go to the next slide. Now, this is the same thing we were just talking about. This is HPI. You see the, the little shaded area on the far right side of the slide? That's the recession. These, these charts come from the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis, uh, FRED, which is a wonderful resource, by the way, a lot of data. Um, I think all those series are gonna be little hockey sticks. I think next three to four years are gonna go up at a 45 degree angle. Think about that, okay? That's the power of monetary policy. And I, and I can't emphasize this enough. It's not just don't fight the Fed. Go out and make money, thanks to the Fed, okay? Thank Uncle Jay. As they said in Men in Black, right? All hail Jay, all hail Jay. Yeah, because Jay Powell is propelling a housing boom, the like of which we haven't seen since the early 2000s. In fact, I think the magnitude of boom is going to be higher than last time. Unfortunately, we will eventually see a correction. Go to the next slide. Now... A lot of people in Washington, uh, the flip side of this is that the banks are not doing too well in one to fours right now. The banks uh, back in April, May kind of pulled back from third party. They have come back to some extent. They kept lending now. You know, banks are good at institutional lending. They're good at lending to other companies. And even in 2008, 2009, most of the banks did very well on their loans to IMBs. They didn't take big losses, but when you look at the, re the, the servicing side of banks, as you can see from this chart, they're getting killed. They've been losing money for the past couple of quarters. They're also seeing their MSRs run off because they don't have that third party production coming in. So everything they're doing is basically based on their own branch system. You know, quick funny story. When I was getting ready to buy a house, I had to get pre-approved. So I'm a Bank of America customer. I sent in a web form. They came back and gave me an appointment a week later. I called two IMBs. I won't tell you who they are, but you can guess. I had a phone call the next morning. And one of them, the CEO, is a good friend of mine. And I had to tell him. And, you know, I had the loan approval by 10 o'clock. Okay? That's the difference between a bank and a non-bank. The non-banks want the business. And I, I think it was just a wonderful example. Go ahead and roll the next slide. All right. Another way of looking at what's going on right now, Ginny May early buyouts. Yes. People are buying them. Wells Fargo and Penny Mac are probably the largest. You're going to see more of this activity. Why? Because they can fix these loans and they'll either hang on to them in the case of the banks or they'll sell them back into a pool. If you do a, a mod, you can pool it immediately. If you refi them, you have to hang on to it for a little while. These are the rules Ginny put in place to you know, manage prepayments. They have a lot of people screaming at them, as you can imagine, the Bank of Japan, PIMCO, everybody who buys mortgage-backed securities today is losing money. Why are they losing money? Because when they buy a security for 105 and they get prepayments two months later at par, they're losing five points. If they get an insurance payment at par, they're losing five points, okay? So investors and in whole loans, investors in mortgage-backed securities and investors in mortgage servicing assets who are not good lenders, who can't replace the assets as they run off, are all in big trouble. I've been saying for a while, the hybrid REITs, leverage players, 
who've been holding MSR as like an investment, which I think is great, by the way, uh, are in big trouble because they can't lend. They can't keep up with the Quickens and the Penny Max and the Freedoms and you guys who are probably 60, 70 percent uh, retention on prepays. That's where you have to be if you're going to survive in this market right now. Go to the next slide. So industry outlook. Uh, I've written about this in my column for National Mortgage News. The CARES Act is a big deal. Why? Because you have a number of government seller servicers right now who are using the float on prepayments to take care of certain cash flow requirements that they would normally finance with banks. It's very interesting to note that when you look at the bigger players that are publicly traded, there is almost no increase in their warehouse lines year over year. That is a remarkable thing since their volumes are up fivefold. So, you know, eventually Congress needs to come and fix this, not just for the industry and not just for independent mortgage banks, but also for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They have the same problem. They have this big expense and somebody needs to make them whole, but Congress didn't do that. The second point we already talked about, the policy standoff in Washington. If you get a trillion dollar stimulus bill, that can soak up that $2 trillion sitting at the treasury, then treasury is not gonna have to let too much run off in, other, in order to keep their, their cash balance where they want it. They normally only keep about $150 billion, $200 billion in cash, depending on the time of the year. They have 2 trillion today because they thought they would be spending, but we don't have spending yet. If it turns out that we do half a trillion in stimulus, and Treasury has to release at least a trillion dollars in cash before the debt ceiling falls back to where it was a year ago, then you know we could see no bill issuance for weeks. That's bad. And I can tell you, your colleagues who work on the capital market side, if you apprise them of this possibility, they will not be happy. And you may certainly tell them to call me. Um, the third thing, which I've been working on for the past four days until Mr. Calabria interrupted us, is this effort by the state bank supervisors to impose essentially bank-like capital rules on independent mortgage banks. This is a horrendous development. Um, it is tied to what's going on at the FHFA with Mr. Calabria and the GSEs. And you know, it's not a, a, an overstatement to say that we could put a lot of people out of business in this industry at precisely the time that we need housing to help the economy. The huge benefit that consumers are getting by refinancing uh, VA and FHA loans is great. We need to do streamlined refis on everything, conventionals, bank loans, just refi them, increase household income, decrease debt service costs, and you also improve the credit. You don't need an appraisal, just refi the damn thing and be done with it. I think, unfortunately, we've had a couple of years of just bizarre policy when it comes to uh, housing in Washington. On the one hand, we're putting handcuffs on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. On the other hand, we're talking about releasing them from government control, which is a total joke, given the former, right? So, you know, what I would say to you is you've got to pay attention to what's going on, both with the Financial Stability Oversight Council and this group of state bank supervisors, what they think they can do, and I'm gonna write this in my next column for National Mortgage News, is if take New York State's power to uh, supervise safety and soundness of non-banks and export it nationally. That's essentially what they're trying to do. They're trying to use the same framework where, that we saw with the National Mortgage Settlement and kind of infer that they have the same power as the Fed and the OCC and the FDIC with respect to banks. They're gonna put requirements on us and costs and a lot more regulation, but we don't get the benefits of being a bank. We don't get access to the discount window. We don't get anything. So I think for me, the one thing I want you to really focus on, talk to the people you work with in Washington is this proposal. The comment period for this is over at the end of the month. And I would urge you to take a look at it, weigh in, you know, the NBA, the other trades are working on this, of course. I think some of the bigger issuers will comment as well. But it's important for the smaller issuers too, because this may only impact, you know, the top 10 right now. But trust me, they're going to come back for you. I think that's it. But let's we'll see if we've got any more slides here. Nope, that's it. So if you want more reading, uh, this is where you find me.
Um, in particular, the research papers, there's a couple things up there on Ginime assets that you guys may find uh, interesting. And then, of course, uh, the blog and the column on uh, National Mortgage News, which is such great fun. I love doing that column. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I've got. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Hey, Nicole, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. Uh, Chris, that was, wow. That, I just, I knew you'd finish this off with a bang. Uh, you know, back in March and April and May, we kind of hung in the precipice as mortgage bankers. So Jake, I know you were uh, emailing me or, or you were in the chat on that. Any uh, things you want to ask Chris back, back when we were all just uh, hanging by the <laughs> well, the whole, the whole industry was. I mean, we, yeah. we were at 244 million, uh, Chris, um, cash uh, with our size, a requirement of 60 million. Now it's changed to 100 million. Um, but we went from 244 million to 68 million in about nine business days. Um, yep. Our net worth now is over 900 million and we have more cash, but, but, and we're going to close 65 billion this year. 39 billion last year and still over 50% purchase. But when you respecting what just happened within the last 48 hours, what kind of net worth um, for the IBS is, are you concerned about anything that, uh, less than a certain number of what would you guesstimate? Cause there's going to be a lot of competitors. This thing with liquid, this thing with um, this net worth requirement. I mean, at the end of the day as a mortgagee and even in the broker world, all anybody cares about is how much cash you have. That's right. You can say a hundred things about a hundred things, but at the end of the day, the question is, what is your cash position? That's all anybody cares about. What, what's your perspective on that as we go forward? Well, if these rules are uh, put into place, it, clearly it's going to be higher. You're, you're going to need to try and term out as much of your funding requirements as you can and take less from the warehouse banks. That's one of the messages that you hear very clearly coming from FHFA and the uh, folks on the FSOC, they are concerned, I think wrongly, that the banks could cut you off. And I say to them, look, if we didn't shoot everybody in 2018, when half the industry was in default, uh, why are we going to do it now? But they don't seem to want to hear such arguments. So I would tell you that you're going to almost be facing net worth requirements and cash requirements that look a lot like a broker dealer, you know, and they don't want to give you uh, credit for unused or uncommitted lines and things like this. Uh, I, I think there will be a reaction, but people in the industry uh, tend to not really pay attention to this stuff except for the big guys. And yet I think we've got to pay attention. I, I even think that with respect to the, uh, the FSOC and the CSBS uh, stuff, you, you may see litigation. You may see the industry just go after them uh, for lack of legal authority to do what they're doing. Because look, there is no federal statute that says the uh, state bank supervisors can you know, regulate you like banks. That does not exist, but they think they have a political opportunity to push the envelope now, and I think they will. It's so, interesting because loan officers don't see this part. People on the street, they don't, they don't circle this part mentally on a day-to-day -day basis. They may make a decision to go to another company, and they never think about that company's potential net worth. Right. That's and, right. And, and that, that issue, because systems have a lot to do with success in a company. And it's interesting to watch. It'll be interesting to watch this play out because I'm sure you would appreciate, Chris, we had to be very involved with the MBA starting March, April, May. Having started this business in 1984, never was that much till this year. That's right. And now that we are, we will continue to be because even though we're, you know, we're in probably the top, let's say, five largest uh, non-banks in the country, it doesn't mean anything. It means you better stay close to the MBA and the people in Washington because things can change. And then guess what? Oh, well. Well, no, that's quite right. You know, there have been efforts in the past to get the independent mortgage banks organized on their own, but most of the trades represent everybody in the marketplace. And that's okay. I think they actually do a good job, but you know, to your point, um, you know, I'm affiliated with a little broker dealer in New York, Cohen and company, and we trade TBAs. We do gestation so we have a pretty good view of the market. And I got to say, this has been quite a year. It, it really has been. Um, we, at one point, I think our borrowers and our gestation program had handed us almost all the cash they had. And we had to hold it for 30 days and then give it back. Um, so that was pro probably a pretty damn good stress test, if you, you know what I mean. 
Uh, and I think, uh, unfortunately, the rules they are thinking about putting in place are going to complicate our lives. And I will say, too, Ginny is not the problem here. The guys at Ginny May, I think, have gone out of their way to work with the industry. But the FHFA under Mr. Calabria, until they get him out of there and put a new uh, head in place, um, I think we have a problem. You know, it's interesting. I'll just make one more comment, Chris, because we've never talked before. But when we, when you have Fannie and Mae and Freddie Mac tell us, okay, because the broker dealers, what is your cash position if the if the Fed does A, B, or C, April fifth, April sixth, April seventh? What's your cash position? Right. Um, the, though you cannot imp impact onto the origination side how how crazy those conversations are, because what you learn is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yeah, they, they want you and they expect you to have great compliance and regulatory and all that stuff. But all they care about is four things. C-A-S-H. That's all right. that matters. Cash. That's right. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, you saw uh, our friend Brinkman leave. Uh, you know, Adolfo Marsal is leaving. A number of other really, you know, very good people are leaving uh, FHFA and the GSEs. So my fear is that if we don't see a change in leadership soon, uh, we're going to be dealing with a lot of ideologues who may or may not understand the industry. And I'm not sure that's going to be helpful. Well, um, just means we'll have stuff to do. Yes, but it'll keep me busy. I get lots of email. <laughs> well, this was, this was great, Chris. Uh, Nicole, anything for Chris before we let him? And thank you again for being on with us today. Uh, I do have a question for you, but I'm going to let Nicole jump in real quick. Then I'll, I'll go to my question. I just want to make sure really quickly that the one question that we do have uh, that went unanswered, I want to make sure that it was answered. Um, and it just asks, uh, Chris, would the potential liquidity rule negatively affect larger IMBs such as Fairway or primarily the smaller ones? I think to start, it's going to be top 10 by volume. They're also looking at your servicing footprint because the folks on the FSOC and the CSBS think that servicers are a source of systemic risk. I've been trying to convince them otherwise for a long time, but they don't want to hear it. So yes, I would assume if you're a top 10 originator, especially in the conventionals, then that's going to apply to you. Yeah. And, and Nicole, the reason that one of the reasons what, what we're, we don't share this stuff with people because we don't, because nobody cares about it anyhow. It's the main reason we went and got debt because yeah. we, we have yeah. access to more if we need it. Now we don't want it, but if we had to get it, we're, we're set for it. So well, um, my guess is, you know, to your earlier question, if you could get a third of your liquidity termed out and over time work those yields down, they're all tightening, by the way, if you follow the complex, even the private issuers, then they, I think they will give you a lot more consideration than they will if you're 90% warehouse financed. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, Chris, my question for you, I know you're moving out of the city and, uh, I'll, you know, follow you. you got a puppy. The puppy needs a house. The puppy needs, <laughs> well, the puppy needs a house, but we love New York city. Uh, when do you, when do you see it coming back? When do you think Broadway's going to open and things are going to, how long to, to recover from the mess in New York city? Well, look, I'm married to a beautiful Dutch girl. Okay. And the Dutch built New York city for business. They built it for efficiency and to pre, you know, bring people together in a concentrated way. You can't do social distancing in New York. Right. Um, social distancing in New York on the subway means people won't touch you. Okay. <laughs> so, no, really. So I love the city. My wife is a ballerina. She loves the city. We support the arts. We're all in. But you know what? The buildings will not open until there's some kind of liability protection for landlords. That's what uh, the Senate's been fighting over. And I also think that for employers, uh, since this is stretching into year two, uh, JP, all the rest of them, Goldman, they're going to be moving people out of here. Because, you know, for me, I don't have to be here. Uh, my wife had an office on Park Avenue. I'm not sure that office will reopen. So her firm is up in Connecticut. We're going to Briarcliff Manor, New York. And, you know, outside the city, things are relatively normal. You know, you don't have theaters open, but yeah. people are still able to function. The city is tough right now. It really is. I mean, yeah. just going to the grocery store today was quite an ordeal. Um, and people are trying their hardest, but you got to really feel for these people. 
Uh, I took care of my garage guys yesterday and half the damn garage is empty. That means they're not making any tips. So if you roll that model across all the working people in this city, the, the layoffs we just saw today from Marriott, the, well, the assets only quarter utilized. They don't need those people. So I think the city is going to be in big trouble until we get people in government who are more reasonable. The big problem is that the business community gave up on Albany years ago and they gave up on New York City years ago. So if you look at the people who are in power right now, they're not a particularly friendly bunch. You know, my landlord was chairman of the MTA for years and he's a big commercial player. They're not investing in New York. They're investing in San Antonio and Dallas and Charlotte yeah. where they're greeted as friends. Here they're enemies. So wow. our whole business, you know, when we face political issues and have to deal with regulation and everything else, there's a certain class of politician out there that doesn't want to hear it from us. And, and it's hard to even have a reasonable conversation with these people. Rent control. We put rent control in place last year. It has made a lot of multifamily assets in the city unfinanceable. Think about that. So oh. if you're the bank that holds that mortgage, what do you do? You roll it? You charge it off? I mean, think about it. New York Community Bank, all the small players in the city who do multifamily because it's such a wonderful asset. People love it. But you can't finance it now because of the rent control laws. So there's a lot of big changes that have to happen in New York City before this becomes an attractive place again. Mm. And this is part of the catharsis uh, I think we got to go through. Yeah, tragic. It's, you know, just a lovely, lovely city. Thank you again, Chris. Also, yeah. hopefully we get to have you back. Just appreciate you being on so much. And again, love following you on Twitter, the stuff you post every day. And, and, and you're a frequent poster, always learning from your- Well, audience. you got to keep the dogs hungry. <laughs> I know. I know. I love it. I love it. So thank you. Thank you again, right. Chris. We just- Be safe, so guys. Happy yeah. New Year. All right. Yeah. I just want to thank everybody. Again, I just want to do a shout out. Barry, I still see you on here. And thank you. And Ivy, uh, Dave- Rob Chrisman, Mike Fratitoni, and then all also our Christopher Whalen. I'm so hoping this was helpful that you got your, uh, you know, your PhD today in housing and the economics that we presented. And thanks again to Nicole, fabulous, Brian Clute, Peter Beanland, of course, and Ray, and always Jake, thank you. Thank you for being on. Just grateful. We're so happy that we get to do this type of stuff here at Fairway. Not every company lets you do these kinds of things. So Jake, thank you for letting us paint and letting, letting us create and then uh, push this stuff out to you guys so that you keep learning, you keep growing. Everybody get back to that purchase business. That was loud and clear. Uh, I liked Christopher's take on interest rates. I don't know about you, Nicole. I was super excited about that. I'm like, 3.3? No, let's go. Let's keep them down for a while. So everybody, thank you again. And we got to do the wave for Christopher. We didn't get to do that at the very end. And then our last thing is we do run to the roar here at Fairway, at Fairway Ignite. And that's to face your fear. We got to do it every single day. One, two, three, gang. <laughs> All right. God bless everybody. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Way to hang in there. And we finished on time. Nice job, team. Nice job. Thank you, Peter, Nicole, Ray, Brian. Woohoo.